Hello everyone. Um, welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, today is an amazing day. Um, if you don't know me, I'm a medical student. Um, I'm studying radiology. I'm in my third year med school. And apart from being a medical student, I'm also proficient in medical writing. And um, today we're going to talk about things relating to medical writing, health writing. You know, the two of them are very different. Right. So today I invited an amazing guest today. Um, so she's going to like talk about herself and what she do. Then we hit um, start up what we have today. So um, Maggie, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for having me, Ransom. Um, so I'm Maggie Amy. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also a freelance health writer and a medical personal finance writer. So I'm also the owner of the Write RN LLC. Uh, you may know what a health writer does, but as a medical personal finance writer, I write articles about health insurance, um, you know, medical bills, uh, budgeting for healthcare costs, and ways that consumers can minimize their medical debt, as well as providing tips for um, you know, navigating the U.S. healthcare system. So before we, you know, I have questions for you to answer. Before we, you know, dive into the question, I want you to differentiate the, the difference between medical writing and health writing. What was the difference? So the main difference with medical writing and health writing to me really is health writing is more consumer facing articles. So whereas medical writing is more technical. So a medical writer may be writing pieces that target um, medical professionals, other medical organizations, whereas a health writer is more focused on writing uh, pieces that are more consumer facing uh, to educate you know, lay people, the general um, audience. Okay, so can a health can writer help. become a medical writer? I'm sorry? Um, can a health writer become a medical writer or can a medical writer become a health writer? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so a health writer can easily become a medical writer. Again, being a medical writer is more um, research and science heavy. Whereas a health writer, of course, we do do research, but um, the writing that we do is more consumer facing. Therefore, we can definitely switch between the two. Amazing. So Maggie, thank you so much for differentiating the two for us. Um, I believe that the audience will you know, grab something off it. So today I have a series of questions for you. So um, I believe that you're prepared for it, Maggie, right? <laughs> Let's do this. Yes, yes, of course. So, the first question goes this way. Um, okay, what are the key elements, right, of effective health writing that can engage and educate a wide range of readers? So tell us the elements as a medical writer or as a health writer you know, to engage a lot audience and also educate them so that they can be um, engaged and feel the human connection in terms of writing. So tell us, explain, you know, in details about the elements that um, are very effective that medical writers or health writers can use to engage and educate a very large audience, you know, so tell us. Yeah, well, you know, so that's a very good question because that's something that we as health writers, we need to be able to understand. When I sit down to write, you know, I envision the person on the other side of the screen, if you will. So I want them to be able to fully understand the information. So I always thought with that person in mind, um, as a nurse in clinical practice, um, if I'm educating a patient, right, face-to-face -face or even on the phone, um, you know, in triage, for example, I can 
assess what the patient knows about the topic. You know, I can ask questions and then build from there. Also with, you know, face-to-face, -face, I can also assess uh, visual cues. I can assess, um, you know, facial expressions, body language that tells me if the person understands what I'm talking about. With writing, we don't have that luxury, right? So I, I go with the assumption that the reader doesn't have strong health literacy skills, right? So that they don't know anything or much about the topic. So how do I do that? Keep it simple. So use simple terms and explanations. Um, you know, I keep my writing mostly at an A grade level. You know, evidently that goes for, you know, consumer facing articles. I'm a health writer. Um, um, you know, avoid medical terms or explain what they mean if I have to use them. You know, for example, you know, I'll say heart attack say heart attack instead of myocardial infarction, right? Or if I'm talking about, you know, in oncology, I read about oncology a lot. So if I'm talking about sarcoma, I make sure to explain what type of cancer it is, right? So you also want to think about your readers who are also likely short of time, right? People have a lot to do. People tend to have a short attention span. So you don't want to lose or confuse them with complex health information. They'll just tune out. Um, one thing that I like to do a lot is include relatable examples, right? And analogies to make it easier for the reader to understand the concept. Um, and then be objective, be objective, be, be factual, especially when discussing study results, you know, you try to show both sides of things. Um, I think it's a way of empowering the readers as well, you know, to think about the topic, um, you know, the findings from different angles, right? And before making a decision. And then um, one last thing I would say, and it's something that we talk about a lot is sharing stories. You know, that's always a great idea. People connect with real experiences, right? So if you can tell, a per if you have a personal story to tell, or if you can share a patient's journey that could relate to the topic, then by all means do that. So that can make things even more relatable to the reader. And I mean, especially now with AI. So this is something that's, that, you know, we want to try to include in, in our writing as much as possible. Um, and then use empathy, you know, I, I use empathy in my writing. Uh, so be understanding of the reader's concerns, provide, you know, solutions that actually make a difference, right? So you want to give practical advice that people can use like good takeaways. Whoa, amazing, Maggie, really amazing, like really amazing. So before we move forward, I, I really loved what you said about stories, you know. I could remember when I wrote my story about how I started my medical writing because um, I started monetizing my medical writing since I was in my first day in medical writing. That was in 2020, um, mm -hmm. three years ago. Um, is when I started monetizing my, my writing, you know. I started getting clients. Um, my first client was at Upwork. Um, I was paid for five dollars. Like I was, when I was paid, I was I was over the moon. Like I was a big boy then. Like <laughs> I was feeling I was on top of the world, you know. But nevertheless, um, I would say something about. I want to talk about backgrounds. Do do you what what do you have to say about backgrounds? Does but background affect health writers or medical writers? You mean the background? Yeah, does it, do they have to be, um, like, have a health something kind of background? Is it more that you can, for instance, you're, you're a nurse right now, you have a health background, and you can, you can, you're very proficient in terms of medical writing. So what do you have to say about someone that is a health writer that don't have an, any background in, in medicine or healthcare? Do, what are the benefits? How would they cope with? you know, engaging the audience in the wide range? Well, I mean, you don't have to have a medical background to to be a proficient health writer. I know I know some very proficient health writers who are who don't have a medical background or don't have 
credentials, um, they, you know, they may have some experience, but they're not credentialed medical professionals and they do very well with health writing. It's just, it's, it's really a matter of understanding how to go about writing consumer facing health articles. Um, that said, having credentials such as being a nurse or, you know, an MD, um, a nutritionist, what have you, helps in that respect because you would have had the firsthand experience of dealing with patients. So you can anticipate patient needs. So you can discuss that already in the in your articles without you know having to go search for the information. So you would have had those firsthand experiences. Um, but yeah, so I, yeah, I, I don't know that having a medical background is absolutely necessary to be a proficient health writer, but it definitely helps. And it also helps with, um, you know, ranking for Google. So having that credential behind your name as an author can help make a difference. That's amazing, Maggie. That's really amazing. Um, I do agree to what you said. Um, the second question goes this way. Um, how can health writers um, strike a balance between providing accurate and evidence-based information while still making the content accessible and understandable to non-medical audience? So this is kind of like relating to my question I asked about background. So how do health writers or medical writers strike a balance between, you know, evidence-based um, information, you know, you know, and still making it, you know, accessible to a wide mm -hmm. range of audience and understandable to non-medical audiences. So what do you have some of that, Maggie? Yeah, so, so that's a great question because that's a skill every health writer, right? Whether you have a background, whether you're a, prof a medical professional or not, that's a skill that every health writer needs to have, right? Um, so, it's always backing up your writing with reliable sources. So you want to make sure you cite studies, you want to cite research to show that your information is evidence-based, right? So um, how do you do that? You want to present the data, present the facts. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you want to present different perspectives on the topic and then present studies that both support and refute the claim, right? If applicable, um, that way you'll not only, you know, build trust with your readers and educate them, of course, but you also empower them to kind of help them make, you know, informed decisions when you present facts, right? Of course, you break down the facts into simple terms that they can understand. So, you know, like when presenting research, I like to break down complex terms into simple explanations, as I said. So, you know, you want to think about how you'd explain it to a friend. Um, we mentioned the eighth grade reading level, how you would um, talk to a child. So an eighth grader is what, 13 or 14 or maybe 12, year, 12 years old. So, you know, you want to define technical terms clearly. So you wanna use examples and, and try to relate what's being discussed to something that people can easily understand and connect with, right? So use visuals if you can, of course, um, you know, that, that's always helpful. If, if the information is really heavy or really dense, so you wanna break it into smaller sections. Um, so that's where formatting also plays a role in, you know, conveying all the information that you want to convey. So you want to try to incorporate a uh, key takeaway in each section just to, you know, give people a quick snippet of the information that's involved, you know, like a quick summary. Um, again, think about people maybe short on time, they're in a hurry, they have things to do, and but they need the information. That's evidently why they're searching for it. Um. Yeah, and then, you know, use active voice. We hear about that all the time. So, you know, so say use Grammarly. Grammarly is very helpful when it comes to identifying passive language. So you want to try and avoid passive language. For example, you want to say you can instead of, you know, patients are advised to. Awesome. This is an amazing explanation, Maggie. Um, 
you know, that's what health writers do about breaking down mega, mega, medical jargons into, um, you know, little pieces that are really understandable, you know, to medical audience out there. So um, I believe that the audience, you know, will, will learn something from this because um, there are people that watch this video that are not medical audience or medical you know practitioners or whatever so they'll be like mm -hmm. okay how do, does this concern me so it does concern you you know because while you're reading you know some articles or some journals publications made from medical writers or health writers you can understand because of the um the little pieces is that really understand and that's amazing thank you so much for explaining that first, Maggie. Um, one yeah. more question goes to, in the era of abundant health information online, you can go online, you see a whole lot of, um, yes. <laughs> you know, abundant health information like encyclopedia, you know, how can health writers ensure the credibility and reliability, reliability. of their sources and help them, yeah. And how can they help readers differentiate between trustworthy and unreliable information? So can you explain that first, Maggie? Yes, um, absolutely. And and you have some great questions there, and some. And this is another extremely important skill for health writers to to master, right? So, um, you know, it's absolutely crucial. Like we have to take the time to vet our sources thoroughly. Again, the consumers are kind of re are relying on us as health writers to explain matters to them, to explain you know a topic to them. They want to and they're looking up something, so they want to be able to understand it, and they want to know that the information they're receiving is accurate, right? As accurate as it's going to be. Um, that's probably why they're not on TikTok looking it up, but they are you know online on Google looking it up from. If some someone hopefully who has um, all the information and can give them accurate info. So how do you do that? One thing that I say is, um, you know, check the author's credentials, right? So you want to check who they're affiliated with because that can make a difference. Such as, you know, if they're affiliated with an institution or organization, you want to, you know, as a health writer. So you want to know what well, could the study results that this person authored, could that could those results be biased because of their affiliation? So that's the one thing I always take into account is scroll all the way down to the bottom of that study and find out who they're affiliated with, right? Um, stick to primary sources. So for instead, for example, use um, I use the NIH, um, use the CDC, et cetera, those primary sources. Also use well-known organizations, you know, like the um, American Cancer Society. I mentioned that I read a lot about oncology. Um, you know, if you're writing about dermatology, use sources, information from the American Association of Dermatology or, you know, government sites that are reputable. Um, the other thing that I try to do is try to cite peer-reviewed studies whenever possible. They're not always available, but I try to drill down to peer-reviewed studies, right? And then, you know, read multiple sources, right? To be sure that the information is, is um, consistent. So I don't rely on one single study, you know, as I said earlier, that may be skewed, right? And then I don't, don't cherry pick either just to make a point. So you want to be objective, you want to be a factual. And as I said, you want to present all the information to your reader. So, you know, if you're using curated sources, check the author's credentials as well. Um, you know, that tells you a lot. So usually if you click on the author's name on, on a published article online, there should be some information about about you know their experience, their affiliation. So you want to be mindful of that. And that goes for us as health writers and for the audience. So they can always check out the author's credentials as well to see um, how reliable they are. And then um, you know, I would say use, of course, try to use recent articles, right? So healthcare is always evolving. Um, 
you know, medical guidelines are always changing. You know that, Ransom. So, you know, an article that was yeah, written 15 years ago might not ne be necessarily relevant today. So you want to make sure that you're using information that's current. Um, and of course, you know, include the links. Include the links so your readers can make their own evaluations. Again, it's it's about, you know, empowering the readers as well, right? You give them information, but you also empower them to be able to do their own research. So, you know, if you come across data that's some, a lot of times I come across data that's preliminary, right? Or, you know, that needs more research. Then I make sure to tell that to my readers, you know, this is the information that we have available, but more research is needed. Something as simple as that. So, um, you know, if you're discussing studies that have small sample sizes, you know, it's not representative of the general population. So, um, you know, if you're using those types of studies, tell the readers that too, it's a small study, you know. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, as health writers, as I think I mentioned earlier, our role is not just to convey health information, but we also have a responsibility to promote um, information literacy, right? So we educate the reader, we give them the information they're looking for, but we also want to help the readers become, you know, smart consumers of information, right? So especially as you mentioned, um, with medical misinformation being so, so prevalent, we want to give them the skills so that they can spot when something they read is or hear is not reliable, right? And then they can go do their own research. So we can help achieve that by being, um, you know, truthful and honest with data. Wow, amazing, Maggie. Um, I, I, I was really, really engaged at what you were saying, you know, very, very engaged. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, sure. As a radiology medical student, um, I've during my second year um, clinical rotations, I I was opportune to, you know, meet a couple of patients suffering all different kinds of diseases and stuff. So let's talk about the sensitive talk, topics about um, health issues. So um, you've been doing some writings on oncology and that's amazing because I've written some articles on oncology too. So I have pretty, idea about what that means so i would love if you can tell me what are they okay looking at the world right now the medical whatever is really changing you know the artificial artificial intelligence is really taking over everything so what is the um what are the health issues that you can talk about today to bring more awareness and increase more you know for people to be aware about it. So any diseases that you can think or any health issues that are really sensitive that the audience needs to know about and the precautions, do you have any for us? Well, you mean, do you mean when we're discussing sensitive topics, you know, such as something as oncology or, or is, is that what you mean? Like how would the health writer be able to address that? correctly? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And like you said, in oncology, yeah, those can be sensitive topics as well. Um, so just know your limits, right? So if I'm unsure about a topic, even though I've done a lot of um, oncology, I've worked a lot in oncology as a nurse, if I'm in sh unsure about a topic, or if I don't know you know, what's appropriate to say, or if I don't know the correct terminology of something that I may not be comfortable with, reach out to experts, you know, reach out to your SMEs, your subject matter experts. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to, again, this is where empathy and respect come into play. And, and that really is across the board, not just when discussing sensitive topics. So, you know, you want to use inclusive language whenever possible, right? Avoid isolating people. Um, but, you know, the, the only thing that I've come across in my writing is that the use of inclusive language 
is usually depending on the public on the publication. So some publications don't really um, are not proponents of it. So you know that's something that you'll have to discuss with the publication. Um, but that's something that's absolutely important to keep in mind. One thing that um, I also learned from a publication that I work with right now is to avoid labeling people with a health condition, right? So in other words, um, you know, avoid saying something like she's a diabetic, right? If you think about it, diabetes is not who the person is, right? But it's rather, it's, it's an illness that the person has has. So instead, you know, say she has diabetes instead of saying she's a diabetic. And it makes a difference. This is something that I've learned just from, you know, working with a publication you never really thought about. The effect yeah. of switching those words until, you know, you actually have to think about it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, and then you want to be, you know, when talking about race, when talking about gender, when talking about ethnicity or age. So you want to be very sensitive and respectful as, as well. You know, and then just educate yourself to be culturally competent. You know, um, we write a lot about different cultures, different um, genders. So you want to, again, avoid isolating people, try to use the inclusive language when you can, and then try to be as culturally competent as possible. And um, yeah, it, it makes a significant difference for the readers as well. Awesome, Maggie, really awesome. Um, thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Um, I do appreciate your time, Maggie. Um, I know you're a very busy person, you know, taking our time to honor my invitation is really amazing. I adore you for that. Um, um, so what what is the last word you have to tell my audience? Like people that are trying to like thinking about joining, you know, medical communication industry, trying to like be a medical writer or health writer or any kind of writing expertise. So what is your your last advice for them? Yeah, well, you know, it's I think writing is, or health writing is something, as we talked about earlier, that most um, anybody who really is interested in the field can do. You don't have to have a credential. You don't have to have a medical background to do it, although it does help. Um, so, you know, when you're writing, Again, try to put yourself, empathize with the reader, try to put yourself in the reader's shoes, understand what the reader may or may not know, and then go from there. Be mindful of um, formatting, how you do that. Try to um, incorporate pictures if you can, as we say, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, and then again, you want to write in a way that empowers the readers. So you want to provide tips for the readers, right? Tips that they can realistically achieve. So, you know, um, include maybe questions that the readers can ask others, for example, to again, help empower them. If they're going to undergo a procedure, um, you know, you want to be want them to be well informed from your article. So, you know, let's say if I'm writing about a hysterectomy, I'll give my readers a list of potential questions to ask their healthcare providers, right? To make sure that they understand, right, their, their post-op care. So again, you know, use supportive, use empowering, empowering language, be positive, be encouraging in your writing, and of course, be mindful of being factual, doing your research, um, not just reading the abstract, but reading the full article to make sure that you understand what is being talked about. Amazing. Thank you so much, Maggie, for this um, opportunity to come talk, you know, give us your professional talkings about things relating to medical writing. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so, so today's going to be um, like, I'm just going to like wrap everything up right now, you know, so um, Maggie, I, I can't really thank you enough for honoring my invitation, but just to, you know, summarize everything, I'll just have to say, um, 
as you're watching this video, try to um, fix some notes and everything so they can grab whatever we've said. So sorry, that's my, my dog making noise over there. My, my dog is really making noise in the background. That's okay. Um, so sorry about they, they do that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. So um, just make sure you you round up everything and get um, try to, you know, action speaks, you know, more louder than voices. So have to take actions and everything. So Maggie, thank you so much for this. I'm going to call it a day. It's my thank pleasure. You so much. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, Vincent. Have a good one. You too.